Dramatic wave swept shore, the boundary where two natural realms collide, where land and sea meet in eternal conflict and compromise. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. This is the magnificent coastline of the Pacific Northwest. Here, cold waters full of nutrients rise up from the deep to meet those of mineral rich streams flowing down the coastal mountains. Together, they nourish an extravagant diversity of living things. In these cold, fertile waters, many animals actually live longer than those in warmer seas. And as we'll see, some reach gigantic proportions. Even the constant pounding of the waves increases the productivity of our great northwest shoreline. And out there, beyond the breaking surf, there is a world of unseen beauty under the Emerald Sea. A shadow drifts between the darkness and the sun. And watchful eyes mark the passage of a giant a monarch of a world whose inhabitants may seem as alien to us as those of some strange planet. The creatures which call this world their home come in a startling array of shapes and forms, creatures at once forbidding and beguiling. This is a world of the beautiful and the bizarre, a spectacular showcase of creation. The jagged peaks of the coastal range rise abruptly from the sea along the western edge of British Columbia in Canada, ramparts that mark the end of one world and the beginning of another. Far below, icy streams rush westward, slicing down through glacier-carved fjords to spill their mineral-laden waters into the cold Pacific. Drenched by year-round rains, this land along the western border of the continent boasts great tracts of verdant forests, a shadowed world of giants, unsurpassed for its richness and abundance anywhere on Earth. Though little sunlight reaches the ground, life runs riot in the mossy gloom. And haunting voices, the songs of unseen forest birds, echo through the twilight beneath the towering Douglas firs. A gauzy mist wraps the coast. Sanderlings probe for tiny worms and mole crabs in the backwash of the waves, pausing here to fuel up for the long flight to their nesting grounds high above the Arctic Circle. But sandy beaches are uncommon here. Instead, for hundreds of miles along this northwest coast, crashing waves form a ragged shoreline, pocked with rocky tide pools.
Yet surprisingly, the harsh conditions of this zone between the tides are a boon to living things. The waves that flood this splash zone bring rich nutrients from the deep to nourish life on the rocky shores. The endless surge of moving water may discourage would-be predators and help fledgling animals and plants find new sites to colonize. In the calm between the tides, a giant green anemone extends its stinging tentacles to fish for prey. While on the rocks nearby, other anemones tuck their tentacles inside and wait, along with an ochre sea star, for the rich brine to bathe them once again. Giant California mussels anchored to the rocks by threads as strong as steel, crowd every inch of open space. With them, gooseneck barnacles wait to feast on morsels brought in by waves. Day and night, through ebb and flood, the shoreline throbs with life, a zone of constant change that tests and shapes all that live within it. As the tides retreat, water is funneled through the narrow coastal inlets, gaining force and fury as it goes. The currents here are among the swiftest in the world, attaining speeds of up to 16 knots. Yet even in these tidal channels, living things find the conditions that promote success. These waters are phenomenally productive so rich in minute green plants called phytoplankton that the sea itself takes on their emerald hue. The bull kelp, a giant among undersea plants, bends with the current, trailing its blades through the sunlit shallows. The abundance of nutrients makes this a world of giants. Like the kelp, many animals here grow to record size all benefit from the power of moving water that brings the rich deep sea currents to the surface. Whirlpools form where fast moving water meets a body of slower water. The result is a top to bottom mixing as minerals and dissolved oxygen are swept downward to meet the upwelling nutrients. Like genies that dance in the current, the whirlpools bring life to the dark waters below. Another way the wild energy of the sea helps to fuel the marine food chain. But the sea is ever-changing. In protected bays, the bladders of bull kelp bob like basking animals dozing on the surface. A raft of thick kelp stalks makes a floating platform for a party of Bonaparte's gulls. Below, a forest to rival the most magnificent forests on land.
lit by pale sunlight, the kelp grove is serene and cathedral-like. Living creatures cling to the kelp for shelter and support. Securely moored to the stalk of this tree kelp, puffy white plumos anemones wait to capture prey from the passing tide. Kelps of many kinds crowd these brisk waters, like this ribbon kelp common in the shallows. All are forms of brown algae, simple primitive plants that lack both seeds and flowers. They're the fastest growing plants in the world. Some can grow 18 inches in a single day. As a primary producer of carbohydrates, kelp plays a vital role in the food chains of the nearshore waters. And sea urchins are surely among the most eager of all the kelp consumers. Marching on tiny tube feet, a small horde of urchins swarms over a fallen giant, munching its way through the mineral-rich blades. close-up look at the life in these cold waters dispels the notion that bold, bright colors are confined to tropical reefs. Fuzzy, soft corals form lush gardens here. These creatures so closely resemble flowers that early biologists erroneously classified them as plants. This abundant world where plankton is plentiful and mobility counts for little is a paradise for the vast group of animals called invertebrates, creatures without backbones. Some, like the soft corals, unfurl a web of poison polyps to waylay plankton. But few sea creatures are stranger than the sponges. Among the most primitive of animals, they filter microscopic morsels from the sea. The finger-like form of this sponge is designed to offer minimal resistance to the surging waters. Even the strongest currents find it difficult to dislodge. Giants among the anemone clan, these tall plumos anemones may tower to four feet in height, forming ghostly groves of living animals. The anemones have no need for the rigid bone structure that lends strength and speed to fish and mammals. For most of their lives, they may remain firmly fixed in place, sifting plankton from the moving water. Resembling Grecian columns surmounted by plumes, the anemones are deceptively lovely, for their frills conceal an arsenal of stinging cells capable of injecting poison into any living morsel that drifts their way. Modest relatives of the plumed giants, the crimson sea anemones lay their own seductive snares for prey, beckoning with soft pink arms that pack a deadly poison. Though able to move if they must, these anemones too find little need to travel. For decades, they may cling to the same rock, content to let the currents bring their meals to them. This anemone stings its tiny prey, then hurls it into the flowery mouth in the center of its body.
an alluring and superbly efficient predator in action. When it has finished eating, the anemone retracts its tentacles to digest the meal at leisure. The orange sea pen, another surprising kin of anemones and corals. It sinks a fleshy foot into the sandy bottom to serve as a support. Orienting itself to the current, it picks off plankton from the eddies that flow through its feather-like plume. Like miniature anemones, each polyp is armed with eight tentacles that stun the prey and pass it to the mouth inside the polyp. Reaching three feet in height, the sea pen is one more giant in the Emerald Sea. Like the others, it owes this distinction to the conditions of tide, temperature, and geography, which have made this one of the Earth's richest marine habitats. Fish, too, abound in these waters. But like this red Irish lord, many of the species which make their home near the shore are sedentary bottom dwellers, adept at the arts of deception. Here, another giant, the Puget Sound King Crab, its shell a foot across. True masters of concealment, the crabs use whatever they can find for camouflage. A snail shell serves just fine for this little hermit crab. But in deception, none surpasses the decorator crab. With a living garden festooned upon its shell, the decorator crab all but disappears when it settles to a stop on the seafloor. Caught in the open, another decorator crab sports nothing more than a few sprigs of live red algae fixed upon its forehead. For the hermit crab, an empty shell makes a mobile home, useful cover as it combs the seafloor for food. The tiny mouth parts of the crabs flutter nervously, seeking out the subtle vibrations that spell opportunity or peril. Crabs are among the most successful animals in the sea. Unlike vertebrates, crabs wear their skeletons outside their bodies, important external protection in a world of constant danger. Despite its formidable appearance, this spider crab is a strict vegetarian, not a flesh eater at all. Though its diet is primarily kelp, the crab looks like a fierce predator when its territorial rights are threatened. Rearing up to its maximum height, the crusty little crab does its best to appear as menacing as possible, displaying its powerful claws to warn away any intruder.
This is a busy world. Every creature here has its own peculiar purpose. A scaled worm a full eight inches long hurries on its way, seeking and devouring the scraps of food that have eluded the mouths above. But no creatures here are more surprising or more spellbinding than the nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are cousins of mussels and common garden snails, but they cast off their shells long ago. Many instead protect themselves with poisonous stinging cells. Some, like this hooded nudibranch, have acquired the ability to swim, a handy skill for hunter or for prey. On the seafloor, a cluster of hooded nudibranchs resembles a bouquet of glass flowers. Restless carnivores, they spread their oral veils to sweep the sea for bits of food. They're called the butterflies of the sea. For, like the butterflies on land, many species, such as this orange peel nudibranch, advertise their unappealing tastes with bold displays of color. Lacking eyes, nudibranchs rely on minute chemical sensors in their horns to help them find food and avoid their foes. Though some may seem almost capricious in form, each of the several dozen species of nudibranchs here is designed to fill an individual niche in the natural order. With its tentacles sweeping for food, this eolid nudibranch finds a blade of red algae. Wrapping its mouth around the stalk, it scours the surface for tiny animals to eat. The name nudibranch means naked gill, and it refers to the fact that most of these little mollusks have no internal gills, but instead breathe through the fleshy spines called serrate, which adorn their backs. Dazzling variety is the norm among these tiny dragons of the sea. The serrate of this opalescent nudibranch are arrayed in petal-like clusters while those of the stunning orange eolid suggest the quills of a brightly hued seagoing porcupine. Appearances are deceptive. Though their costumes are like colorful floral displays, most of the nudibranchs are confirmed carnivores. This one, the alabaster nudibranch, cracks open the shells of small snails with its jaws. It prowls the bottom for prey, and a little hermit crab takes the precaution of getting out of the way.
Though some of the nudibranchs will eat almost anything they can kill, others are specialists. At a length of more than a foot, the giant nudibranch is as big as they come. And it dines exclusively on the tube-dwelling anemone, when it can catch it. Entrenched within their tubes, the anemones have only one defense, and they resort to it the moment their tentacles sense trouble. In their homes made of slime and sand, the anemones are safe from all but the most carefully mounted attack. Few stray tentacles are the meager reward for all the effort. But the predator tries a new tack. Cautiously, it arches over the top, and then in. Too late, the anemone is safe for now but the contest between the two will be replayed again and again. So close is the relationship between the giant nudibranchs and the anemones that the predators use the tubes of their prey as an anchor for their eggs. But few among the young nudibranchs are likely to survive the perils that stalk their world. And no predator here is more to be feared than the giant sunflower sea star. Growing to more than three feet across, it's a monster among sea stars. And even the giant nudibranch is careful to avoid it. Fortunately for the nudibranch, when it finds itself in a pinch, it can summon the power to swim. And swim it does in a majestic undersea ballet. Relatives of sea urchins, sea stars occur in a marvelous array of colors and forms. 
Although they have no eyes or even brains as we know them, they are predators without parallel in their world. The tiny tube feet of the sunflower sea star bear down upon a close relation, a grazing sea cucumber. Under normal circumstances, the cucumber is the most unflappable of creatures, but faced with the prospect of becoming a meal for its giant kin, it calls upon rarely needed escape skills. Still seeking food, the great predator moves on, and an army of green sea urchins scrambles for safety. With its suction-tipped feet clawing the air, the sea star descends on its prey. But the urchins are not without defenses. Hidden among their spines are hair-like stalks tipped with tiny jaws, and each delivers a bite which the sea star can feel. With hundreds of these pincers embedded in its flesh, the predator recoils in pain. The attack concludes. The sea star withdraws. Yet gluttonous as the sunflower sea star may be, it knows better than to tangle with the morning sun star, a species whose diet is devoted exclusively to other sea stars. Though twice the size of the morning star, the big sea star retreats. Moving at a full four feet per minute, the sea star hits its stride the top speed at which a galloping army of tiny tube feet can propel it away. From the air, the sea star's world is a watery maze of islets and channels, a jigsaw puzzle of habitats. This diversity of habitats helps to account for the variety and abundance of life in these northern waters. The deep fjords that indent the coast support a community distinct from that of the current-swept shallows, creatures at home in the twilight below the water's surface. Here, jellyfish are in their element. Some 80 species of the gauzy animals, their tentacles armed with stinging cells, pulse on their daily round-trip journeys up to the sunlit surface. then down again into the shadows. A hydromedusa, so delicate that it seems to be part of the sea itself, trawls for prey in the inky darkness. Here at depths of 80 feet or more are found great clusters of cloud sponges, among the most ancient of all the animals in the sea. At seven feet in diameter, these two are giants, living plankton filters, fixed for life to the rocks on which the colony settled hundreds of years ago.
the sculpted chambers of the sponges make ideal condominiums for a host of small sea creatures, among them juvenile rockfish, which find refuge in the many nooks and crannies. Like a chandelier in an old-time movie palace, a colony of sponges lends splendor to these cold, dark waters. And deeper still, fans of Gorgonian corals uncoil their feathery polyps to fish in the rich green depths. Through the silence, a presence moves, a creature whose ways have long been veiled in mystery and legend. the giant Pacific octopus. This one is a seven-footer, but others are reputed to reach an arm spread of 30 feet and a weight of 600 pounds. By any measure, the creature is a true colossus. Relative of the nudibranchs, the mussels, and the garden snail, the giant octopus is one of the biggest of the mollusks and easily the most advanced of all invertebrates. For 2,000 years, folklore and fable have cast the giant octopus in the role of a bloodthirsty killer. But contrary to the myth, the great octopus is a shy, retiring creature, its gentle nature belying its reputation as a man-eater. Far from lying in ambush for ships, the octopus prefers to haunt the groves and canyons of its undersea domain, seeking the crabs and scallops which comprise a large part of its diet. Through a wonder of parallel evolution, the octopus eye is alike in many details to that of the higher vertebrates, including man. And the complexity and capacity of its brain places it at the head of the class among the invertebrates, a predator which may depend for survival less upon instinct than it does upon strategy. The eight arms of the octopus are fitted with suction cups, which are capable of clamping onto their prey with tremendous holding power. Legend has it that the arms of the octopus squeeze the life from its victims. But actually, the octopus secretes a poison to paralyze its prey and then devours it.
Like most aquatic animals, the octopus breathes through gills, which continuously absorb oxygen from the seawater pumped over them. The water drawn in through a vent behind the head is expelled through a siphon beneath the neck. If it's necessary to move in a hurry, powerful muscles contract the mantle and push water through the siphon with sufficient force to jet the octopus away from danger. In bright daylight, the lids of its eyes remain tightly shut. But when it stalks the seafloor, its powers of sight help it find its prey. When its suckers are pressed against a surface, they expel water to create a vacuum. When these cups are firmly in place, few creatures, no matter how they struggle, can tear free from their grip. Yet despite its strength, the octopus is cautious in its choice of a foe. With single-minded devotion, the male lingcod guards the eggs which its mate is laid. For the octopus, the lingcod eggs would make a fine meal. It will seize any chance to steal the eggs when their defender is distracted. But this time, the father of the brood is more than ready to defend his own. A quick change artist, the octopus pales to ashy white a signal to its foe that it's ready for trouble. But the battle is one-sided. The lingcod is eager for a fight. Escape is now the sole objective of the octopus. With a jet of ink, it lays down a smoke screen to confuse the fish and cover its retreat. The precious eggs are safe, but just in case, the lingcod escorts the octopus away, delivering for good measure one final nip, as a reminder not to come this way again. The wounds acquired in the brief skirmish will not trouble the octopus for long. In the span of its lifetime, which with luck may stretch for up to five years, there will be many battles and many other opportunities for prey. The giant octopus, of course, is not the only hunter which stalks the floor of this green sea. The wolf eel, in spite of its name, is a fish. But it is a fish of a highly specialized sort, one that has adapted in form and behavior to a basically snake-like way of life. Strictly a cold water dweller, the wolf eel often lives to an advanced old age of 15 and can grow to a length of seven feet or more. Despite their ferocious appearance, wolf eels make doting parents. 
Here, the female guards the eggs, visible as the round mass behind her. Remnants of former meals litter the mouth of the den, scraps of sea urchin and scallop, plus the scattered shells of crabs and clams. At the end of a hunting foray, the male returns to the den and takes up his post, ensuring the safety of the eggs from which the next generation of wolf eels will come. With glowering eyes and gaping jaws, he presents a face to deter almost any intruder. His mate, meanwhile, prowls for food, her pectoral fins serving almost as legs to prop her long body up off the bottom. The queen scallop would make a suitable meal, but it's declined. Too small, perhaps, to repay the trouble. But no game is too humble to escape the notice of the most persistent of predators. The strongest shell is no defense against the tenacious grip of the giant sunflower sea star. But the scallop has a strategy for just such a situation. By gulping water and squirting it out, it jets away from one danger only to land in the jaws of another. In the wink of an eye, the shell is cracked open and cast aside to join the remains of the other small creatures who had the misfortune to wind up in the jaws of the wolf of the sea. The final rungs in the food chain belong not to fish, but to mammals, warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals, which throng here to feast on the bounty of fish found in these waters. Stellar sea lions, which may weigh over a ton, haul out in winter on these windswept shores, mingling with their smaller kin, the California sea lions. With plenty to eat, the sea lions grow larger here than anywhere else in the world. Especially in summer, the water is so rich in plankton that visibility is drastically reduced. But the wide saucer eyes of the sea lions serve them well under these conditions. They let in extra light, enabling them to see well, even in the pea soup swirl of plankton. Intelligent and playful, the sea lions seem to enjoy themselves within the hazy blue-green expanses of this northern sea. For the sea lions, life is good along the wild Pacific shore. But there are perils here, and even the heftiest stellar bulls must be ever watchful for the one creature above all others that they fear. killer whale, 
one of the most powerful of all the predators on Earth, an animal whose position is unchallenged at the very pinnacle of the sea life pyramid. The largest member of the dolphin family, the killer whale, or orca, can reach a length of 30 feet and a weight of 10 tons. In intelligence and cunning, it may well outrank all other sea life. Though they are swift and strong enough to prey on sea lions, dolphins, and even on great whales, the orcas gathered in this strait have come to feast on salmon and to socialize. From birth to death, the orcas travel in a close-knit clan, staying in touch by means of a complex system of squeaks, trills, screams, and whistles. Though the orcas have long been feared as man-eaters, no credible evidence exists of deliberate attacks on man. Here on the coast of British Columbia, where they've gathered in great numbers for untold millennia, those who know them best, the coastal Indians, still revere them as guardians and gods, the incarnation of honored chieftains and skillful seal hunters. Each of the more than 300 orcas to be found in these waters can be identified by the distinctive markings on their backs and by the characteristic shape of their tall dorsal fins. Yet despite years of study and observation, far more questions than answers exist about the orcas and their way of life. It's well known that their high frequency clicks function as a kind of sonar to help them find their prey. But precisely how this works remains a mystery. The Emerald Sea is a world of giants and of unsuspected marvels. But all this wondrous life, from the smallest crab to the mighty orca, depends upon a fragile balance, a fortunate mix of circumstances which could all too easily be disturbed. Human vigilance and care could guarantee its survival. It may take the best of all our efforts to ensure that this treasure store of wonders we call the Emerald Sea, will endure in all its splendor.